So this is a topic that really falls through the cracks in many ways, and that is the pacemaker ICD pocket. Even for us as EP trainees, you know, ideally in your fellowship, you're always in the lab implanting and you're doing it how you're taught to, but you don't have opportunity to live with the consequences of your actions because you're not seeing those patients in clinic and you certainly won't be seeing them in clinic in the long run. So we don't get to see the downstream of what we do. And then there's always this dichotomy between we have our lab staff who are always in the lab and they're very good at being in the lab, not sure what happens in the clinic. And then we have our clinic staff who are very good with the devices and the patients, but don't have much of a sense of the implant process. So it's nice for us to be here to put these two worlds together and start to see where everyone's coming from and why I'm insisting on things or trying to achieve things in the lab, which may or may not make sense. And it's because I'm thinking about all those people I've seen in clinic and um, how things turned out. So here we're talking about mastering the pacemaker ICD pocket. We'll talk about pouch technologies to reduce uh, erosion and infection. So that's when things go really bad and the device is eroding or you have an infection and we have to do drastic things to correct ourselves. Otherwise, what patients are most concerned about, what they know is what they can see and that is how the device looks and whether they're comfortable. So you don't want them interacting with it. And when you come into uh, you know, private practice, you may inherit a large device population, and now you're managing devices that someone else has implanted. And what I typically find, and it's been in several centers, that devices are implanted too laterally. So they're always in the patient's axilla. And that may be painful, or every time they move their arm, they're interacting with it, and they're aware of it. And that's too much. We don't want them to be thinking about their device at all benefiting from it in every way possible, but they're, otherwise they're completely unaware that it's there if they're looking at it, so, unless they're looking at it. So that's the result we're trying to achieve. And sometimes we do very well, sometimes it gets us into trouble, and sometimes regardless of what you do, um, it doesn't seem to work. So we'll look at, some, we'll look at all of those examples. So just a, a quick disclosure slide. And then because we do put these presentations on YouTube, broad informational topics, hopefully educational. What any implanting EP or device person does in their program is entirely up to them, and uh, we're not responsible. Nevertheless, I think this is helpful. So just to frame the problem, you know, between 1993 and 2008, we had a 96% increase in the number of device implants. So it really spiked, um, broadening indications and um, a broadening patient pool who needed device therapy. In that time, we saw a 210% increase in device infections. So the number of devices that were getting infected was double, um, the increase in infections was double the increase in overall implant volume. And obviously that's not what we want. So why would that be? You know, older patients, more comorbidities, we're doing more ICDs and CRTs, so there's more leads, there's longer procedure times, chance to introduce infections, more replacements, revisions, and upgrades. So whenever we change a device, um, that really has a higher risk of infection than a de novo implant, for example. And then we have more resistant organisms. We have Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis. They're becoming more resistant than they were in the past, and so it's harder to prevent infection. And then the bee in my bonnet is perhaps a lapsing sterile technique. And I think sometimes uh, we can get a little bit um, lazy or forget. You know, we implant in a cath lab, and cath lab culture is very different from a sterile OR culture, which is what we need in the case of device implant. So if you're doing a heart cath, the sterile um, environment is low, just like it is for an ablation procedure. But when you implant a device, now we become hyper acute about infection and sterility. I mean, probably even more than a cardiac OR. So we can't have, you know, accidental table touching, you know, you inadvertently brush against the blue, blue table. Prepping a chest for a device is more than prepping a groin for a catheter. We need to be more careful and do it more systematically. Um, we want to avoid non-essential room entries. There's always someone sticking their head in and, oh, they didn't put a hat or mask on. It must be a cath. I know I can do this. And we've got someone's face and their breath in our device room, you know. And you've seen me go absolutely berserk over that. And there's a reason for it, because infections are high and infections are costly and infections take patients' lives. And then in some programs, it's not what we do, but we have 
you know, other places we have text scrubbing in and out. Like everyone, oh, I scrub in for an hour. And you know, if your case takes longer than an hour, well, now you've got someone new coming in and a new chance for them to introduce, you know, some, some non-sterile prep that they did. So all these things add up. And then we think about, you know, the dust, even the dust in the room. You know, there's dust on these structures in the ceiling, on the C-arm. We're moving these things back and forth during the case. It can flutter down into your pocket. It's not sterile. You know, chances for infection that um, we, really, um, we really want to avoid. So this is what we want. Here is a, a nice lady. She's received a pacemaker. It was two and a half years ago. So this is a very mature pocket and scar. And we can see that pocket, that, that scar is very small. It's nice and flat. You don't see any device contour, probably because she's sort of built generously. But in the long run, this is what she, this is what you want. She has no idea that the pacemaker's there. She never feels it. And you're like, perfect. This is what we'd like every case to be. Here's what someone will look like frequently two weeks out when we see them in clinic. So here there's still, you know, some betadine around. The, the um, edges are a little bit uh, rugged, but that's a nice tight close. And over time, that scar tissue will remodel. It will remodel over months and even years to completely flatten out. And like a plastic surgeon taught me, if you put your finger up and you just massage your scar for a few minutes during the day, and you do that most days, over time your scar will flatten out because the tissue really does remodel to where it eventually looks like this. So that, honestly, it's a little rough, but it looks great and that's a, a, a result we're very happy with as long as um, as long as the patient's happy. So that's two weeks. You know, here's another one. We're getting older, 91-year-old male. This is the three weeks. He's thinner, so you see the device contour. Um, but there's no signs of impingement. So this tissue doesn't look inflamed or dusky, which may be a pre-ischemic sign or a pre-infection sign. The incision is closing very nicely. And you're like, why is that such a nice line when that looks a little rough um, and other ones look a little um, rougher? You know what? I'm going to say patients are different, and everyone scars differently, and their collagen reaction is different, and you take what you get. But you can be assured that as time goes, all scars tend to flatten, and all scars tend to become more like skin color. So this is another um, happy result. We love to see that um, when our patients come back to clinic. Here is a lady five weeks out. Um, you know, with this scar, looks it's, it's very tight, nicely closed. You don't see the device profile, and that is going to um, remodel just beautifully. So we're um, encouraged by that. Now, of course, every time I take off the, 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 the um, Steri strips, I'm wondering if there's any evidence of infection. So what happens when you pull off and you see this? You know, she's a week out. This is just a local allergic reaction to the Steri strip. It might be, um, it might be itchy, but um, it's no problem. This is going to completely resolve. All right, so we don't give antibiotics from that. We reassure the patient. The device looks nice and tightly closed, and um, this is not an issue. So we don't, we don't get excited. And sure enough, seven months later, her scar is very much flat, and all this has resolved. Now you can tell that this is a very you know, generously built woman, we are going to have to revise her pacemaker down the road because she's insisting on pocket pain. And that's something that would really, um, that really does surprise me. You know, I like to have the generator over the lung field on a PA radiograph that looks exactly where it is, looks very nicely positioned. Turns out it wasn't quite right for her. And I will revise these for people if they convince me that it is um, uncomfortable for them. So getting bigger, ICD pocket. Here's an ICD, two weeks out. You know, again, the scar is very nice and tight. All these little lumps and bumps um, are a result of having the sutures pull very tightly together, and that's all going to completely flatten out. You know, that device has a bigger contour, but there's no signs of, of skin being dusky or red. So it, it doesn't look like there's impingement. There's no pre-ischemia, looks like a happy ICD, and you think that this person is going to do um, well as time goes forward. Uh, here's a lady now going on to 10 weeks out. Um, this is an ICD. She is also quite a large lady, hides the ICD very well, that scar maturing very nicely. 
Um, interesting because this is uh, a lady for CRT who had an unfavorable coronary sinus. So we went with this new technique of a Hiss lead to narrow the QRS. We did narrow it a certain degree, um, but her heart failure symptoms didn't improve. So I later referred her to our cardiac surgeon for an epicardial lead placement, which um, you see here. And the, um, the his bundle lead we simply abandoned. So now she's getting her CRT therapy from that um, epicardial lead, and that can be transformational. So we have to not stop at non-responders. We keep pursuing non-responders until we have um, something that works. And here's her by the paste ECG, and with very aggressive programming, we finally obtained the QRS morphology that predicts a beneficial hemodynamic response. And sure enough, she's feeling better um, several weeks after that procedure was done, so it is worth it. And um, I just put that in to see how those scars are progressing kind of at the 10-week um, mark. But she's someone we've worked on several times and it's familiar to you. So here's a young man, Hokum, ICD, appropriate shocks for VT, nine years out, comes for us for a gen change. You know, he's thin, he's very muscular, and that scar has spread out because of stretch marks. That's very hard to avoid, and it's hard to cut through. So what are you going to do to change his generator? Cut right through the scar? That's very hard to uh, sew back together. So what we did here for him is we cut the entire scar out and, um, you know, then put those up. Uh, Pull the, pull the skin together. It's a little bit tighter. Um, nevertheless, several weeks out, and I've seen him, he has the same stretch marks. It's uh, really hard to avoid, but at least hopefully the scar uh, is not compounding. So you can't be too hard on yourself when those um, results occur. Here's an 83-year-old man, ICD CRT generator change referred to us. He's five years out with cardiac cachexia. He has lost 30 pounds, and we see that a lot in our heart failure patients. And as he has that weight loss, lean tissue loss, his pulse generator has migrated laterally, probably from where it was, and now you have this lateral impingement. Luckily, it is not um, uncomfortable for him, but he's certainly aware of it. And this is one reason, particularly in heart failure patients, where we really try to anchor that generator medially to the muscle so that as that patient's disease trajectory progresses, they don't have this lateral slippage of the device, which can be uncomfortable for them. So in those ICDs and those heart failure patients, uh, we really make a point of trying to anchor this generator medially um, to avoid this situation, which is uh, really very common. Here's a case that we all remember, 96-year-old lady. She's short. She's only four foot six. She had a dual chamber pacemaker implanted at um, an outside hospital. She's referred to us because the RV lead has perforated through the right ventricle and the atrial lead has fallen into the right ventricle. So everything that could go wrong had gone wrong. She had a massive left bundle branch block, but fortunately was not pacer dependent at all. So here on echo, we see that lead going through the um, apex. Here it is poking out the apex. You know, an, uh, an embarrassing situation and um, one we needed to help her with. So cardiac surgery on alert. We pulled, the lead, we pulled the leads back, repositioned them. Everything looked great. Felt really good. Looked super the next day. Got discharged the next day. Everyone was happy. What a success story this was. Here she is, post-op day 13 in our clinic. What do you think of that? So there's, looks like there's some hematoma, which we can live with. The scar is certainly tightly closed. It's kind of got this black area here, which is a little bit suspicious. But uh, she's totally unaware of it. She's not uncomfortable. There's no fluctuance, no fever, no stitch abscess, no systemic infection. She's happy. So we're like, let's see you back in another week or two. Well, you know, people live way out in the country. It's hard for them to get around, especially the 96-year-olds. And um, we get her back 10 weeks later. And so she comes in with this. And I want to say, this has been our only infectious complication in my three years at Regional. This is the only time a device that we touched came back, frankly, infected. And I want to give us a break because... Um, 
we didn't do the initial implant and we were revising it too early from the original implant and only been a month before. So she comes back with this and she, you see exposed hardware. This is frankly infected. Again, happily, she was not pacemaker dependent at all. Um, we removed this one in the OR with um, Dr. Catania who helped us with wound management. So here she's eight days post removal. Just leave it open with, um, you know, packing um, with um, wound packing is the strategy we used. The wound center in uh, Sunnyside helped us with this one. And uh, here she is, just a Band-Aid over that. And we let that one heal by secondary intent so that 10 weeks post-removal, it has spontaneously closed to look like this. So nice result in this lady in the long run. <laughs> she got taken on a wild goose chase with the device, the revision, the infection. Now she has no pacemaker, which she never needed in the first place, and uh, she's happy as a lark. So a nice endpoint, but interesting to see the progression in the infection that happened in our lab. And people have published on this. You know, what are the evidences of pocket infection? And there's different ones. Here is just indolent swelling. This device has a bulge, you know. It doesn't look red. It doesn't look inflamed but you kind of see the swelling pattern that can be evidence that this is already infected. When you see the device adhering to the skin, you know, so it's like they're sticking together, that can be an early sign of infection. And then clearly when you see this breakdown and then finally the frank erosion, you know, these are, this is clearly infected. This should be a very concerning sign as should this. So all of these things we're watching for, especially um, in the clinic as our, as our patients come back to see us. Here is somebody, um, an infection that progressed over two years. I can't believe they watched someone for two years, but they did and they took pictures. Here is an early infection. You know, you just see the erythema and the adherence at the site of the device. Here you see frank pus and you know that this has to come out already. But if you wait, Eventually this will happen and there'll be pus breaking through the skin and eventually the wound will be open and the device will be frankly sticking out. So that's the progression. We need to get involved at these stages to um, prevent these stages. Um, but just the interesting things that scare us. So how much does infection happen? For a pacemaker in the first six to 12 months, the risk is 0.5 to 1%. For an ICD over six months, it's almost 2%. And for CRT over two years, it's almost 10%. Now these numbers I can hardly imagine because like I said in our program, we have not had one device infection except for the one that I showed you in, um, in the three years that we've been doing this at regional. So, but these are national numbers and there's different levels of technique. And this is what's been reported. So let's appreciate that the more complicated the device, the higher the risk of infection for all those factors we realized. ICDs twice as much as pacemakers and CRT systems, you know, over twice as much as ICDs. So paralleling device complexity. Um, if that device was implanted at thoracotomy, like say by a cardiac surgeon, their sterile technique is worse than ours and their infectious re risk goes up just by having their device placed in the cardiac um, OR. And then for device replacement and upgrades, the risk is two to four times higher. And we'll look into why that may be. But this is a reason in our generator changes we are super anal about sterile technique is because we respect these numbers. The risk is much higher than a new implant. And now you have chronic hardware, which if that device inf becomes infected is much harder to take out. Okay, now you have to refer the patient for a very um, complicated extraction perhaps, and we're in a life-threatening scenario all because we were sloppy at the time of our generator changes. So that's a scenario that we take um, really, really seriously. What is infecting the devices. So we are protecting against coag negative staph or staph epidermidis, that is 40 some percent of all infections. After that, it is staph aureus. That's methicillin sensitive and methicillin resistant staph aureus. And our routine antibiotics only prophylax against methicillin sensitive staph aureus. So we're potentially leaving a lot of the bugs unaccounted for. And then we're aware that gram negatives and other things can infect the device, but it's really staff that we are um, prophylaxing against and trying to prevent. So barriers to preventing and treating a device infection, 
what are we up against? The device is avascular, it has no blood supply. That means the device can't deliver antibiotics to itself. So if there's, an ana if there's a bacteria on the device, the device cannot fight the infection. Um, if there, and, and then the device, the body grows this avascular tissue capsule to surround the device. The body says, oh, that's a foreign object, so I'm just gonna wall it off with this tissue capsule. Well, there's no blood vessels in that tissue capsule. It's pure collagen. And as a result, we can't get antibiotics through that capsule. And then bacteria, especially staph, if they land on the device, they grow a biofilm. So they proliferate this goo, and they hide in the goo on the device. So even if you bathe it with antibiotics, the bacteria would be resistant to them. Uh, so lots of things working against us when we're trying to prevent these infections leads us to questions that we're going to get to, and that is, would a device envelope impregnated with antibiotics surrounding that device be of benefit? And would a vascularized tissue capsule um, be of benefit? So now we have opportunities for both of these things, and um, we are taking advantage of them. So just to review the history of Staph aureus, in the 1950s, Staph aureus first became resistant to penicillin. In the 70s, it became resistant to methicillin, and that's where we get MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And then in the 90s, it became resistant to vanco, and we got vancomycin-resistant um, enterococcus. And now we're starting to see vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus. And this is scary because we're running out of options to treat these infections. Um, but this is the progression, and right now we are prophylaxing against methicillin staph aureus and wondering about prophylaxing against methicillin-resistant staph aureus. We are doing nothing for these guys. And I think if somebody had those serious infections, it would almost preclude device implant. Another reason to be excited about device infections beyond the cost, beyond the inconvenience, is that these infections kill people. So one year mortality after an infection can be 20 to 60%, um, depending on the type of device, whether it's a pacemaker, an ICD, a CRT. Um, but let's realize that if we infect people and have to take out the hardware, this is predicting their mortality. So another reason to be um, careful. And that's just a concept slide for that biofilm that staph species can proliferate. So they land on the device, they proliferate this goo, they live in the goo, and any antibiotic that comes to the surface of the device, they're protected against. So when the antibiotic is gone, they're again free to um, proliferate. And that's why an infected device has to come out. Once the infection is on the device, there is no way to clear the device. The only solution is to, um, is to take that device out. You cannot clear it. So we prophylax with antibiotics, give antibiotics before our procedures. This lowers infection rates. That's why we do it. Staph aureus is the most common. IV antibiotics should cover at least Staph aureus species. We recognize that almost 50% of Staph is methicillin resistant, and we're not covering that unless we use Vanco. So you ask, is what we're doing sufficient with ANSEF or Clinda? There's no real clear guidelines when to also cover for MRSA. But if someone's had a prior MRSA infection, we almost always use an antibiotic that will um, cover that. And there's this notion, should we be keeping these patients in hospital and continuing antibiotics for five days after the implant? Because the pet pocket is still fresh, so if you keep giving antibiotics, it'll keep flooding the pocket and might prevent um, an infection from developing before that capsule, before that biofilm happens. There are places that advocate for this and do it. We, and like most centers in America, are not one of them. Um, but that is a possibility. So we ask ourselves this question, should we be delivering antibiotics from a device envelope? This has been demonstrated to be effective. It is not standard of care. Should it be standard of care? Um, that's a complicated question, but I think we're moving in that direction. So we talked about the avascular capsule. This is something we see in the lab. This is something our device clinic doesn't know about, and that is every device is surrounded by this collagen-like tissue that does not contain blood vessels, and that is the capsule. So the body just walls off whatever is foreign and says we're going to ignore that, and that's what the capsule is. So. No blood supply, can't deliver antibiotics to the device. 
What's interesting is if you cut out this capsular tissue and you look at it in a microbiology lab, you can find Staph aureus growing inside this capsular tissue. Well, how did it get there? It got there during the device implant, but it didn't become virulent, so it's just hanging out. It's at its condo, its villa. It's just hanging out in the capsule, not doing anything. So you're like, well, we got away with that. Sterile technique was good enough. No, you just got lucky because you let Staph aureus into your pocket. It just didn't create an infection. Um, so again, would a vascularized capsule reduce those dormant bacteria that are in fact living in your capsular tissue? So that's something we have to think about. So just because the patient didn't develop an active infection didn't, doesn't imply that our sterile technique was good enough. You know what I mean? Because we have to um, be avoiding those things. So just another more, more cause to be anal. And here in a CRT system, you just see this very thick capsular material that grows around the device, it encases the leads, lines everything. So you have to cut into that, pull out the device, free the leads, you don't know where they are, they're encased in this capsular tissue. Uh, so we use this plasma blade cautery, which has much less risk of lead damage, and that's certainly helpful. But um, this is the scenario that we are contending with when we change out um, ICD or pacemaker generators is the capsule. And some patients will have very little capsule. Some people will be full of this tissue. You really don't know what you're gonna find until you get in there, um, but it does create uh, issues. So capsulectomy, should we be cutting out these capsules entirely at the time of a generator change? Some people would argue yes. It could help revascularize the pocket. It could cause bleeding and a hematoma you might release bacteria that's living in the capsule that wouldn't have gotten released, and now you've created an infection just by manipulating the capsule. Larry Epstein, electrophysiologist at Brigham and Women's Harvard, our practice is to perform a partial, if not a full capsulectomy to vascularize the old tissue pocket. So certainly some authorities in the field who are aggressively performing capsulectomy at the time of the generator change. And they will tell you it is pseudoscience, but it's their belief, and that's what they do. We, like most centers, don't do partial, full capsulectomies, but often we'll try to cut away a certain amount of the um, capsule tissue to allow resorption of any fluid that may accumulate within the capsule at wound healing, or if there happened to be a bleed, you know that it won't, um, it won't be caught in that um, <clears throat> virtual space, so to speak. How about pocket hematomas? Another thing that strikes fear in us and that I don't like to see on post-operative day one, but they do occur and they can look like a million different things. So here's a very large ecchymosis. Here's a large effusion. Here's a localized bump. Here's a much bigger bump. The treatment is always, you try to wait for these things to resorb. That's what you try to do. And if you're gonna do that, you want your incision to be nice and tight. So when we're closing a pocket, we're always planning for a large hematoma the next day. So we want a nice tight close to be able to um, you know, withstand any hematoma that might form. If there's an active bleeder in there, we're gonna have to go in and explore and cauterize that active bleeder. So another reason to be um, judiciously careful. And let's appreciate bacteria love hematomas. They love blood. I mean, how do you grow bacteria in a, micro, in a microbiology laboratory? You use a blood agar because bacteria love blood. So it stands to reason that a hematoma is going to be a great place for bacteria to grow, and it's another risk for infections. For patients not on antithrombotics, the rate of hematoma formation is estimated at 0.9%. Aspirin, just aspirin, always carries a 1.5-fold risk increase. If you're on aspirin and Plavix, it's a five-fold risk increase. Um, heparin is absolutely a no-no. Unfractionated or low-molecular weight markedly increases the risk of pocket hematoma, and we have to avoid that judiciously and make sure no one's giving subcutaneous heparin to our patients for their DVT after we've implanted a device. Uh, that, that's all you need for a large hematoma. Um, fewer hematomas if you implant on therapeutic warfarin rather than bridging with heparin. So we always just do our generator changes or our procedure on therapeutic warfarin rather than using heparin. And um, if someone's really low risk for a blood clot, why don't you just hold their warfarin and uh, give yourself a higher chance of success. So here's one of our cases. 
you probably remember this one. 59-year-old male, he has a dilated cardiomyopathy attributed to his chronic meth use, LV 20%, AFib completely out of control, 150s, 160s, can't slow him down, he's not going to be compliant, needs an ICD, needs a pacemaker, needs an AVJ ablation, so we gave him a CRT with a His bundle lead, and that worked out great. Well, overnight, he gets an ST elevation MI. I don't know if you remember that. So he goes to the lab, PCI to his LED, gets a Plavix load as well as bivalrudin on post-op day zero from his device. So a large hematoma, not surprisingly, um, manageable but very inconvenient. And again, even with that large blood collection, just give it time. Here he is 23 days out and that has largely resolved. So these things will go away. We don't like them. Every time we implant a device, we want to be ready for some crazy scenario like this to happen and for our implant procedure to be um, able to withstand it. Because if that suture broke loose for any reason and the device was externalized at all, the whole thing has to come out at a huge cost and inconven inconvenience to um, everyone. So uh, a little bit more on him. Here's his three lead device. There's our ablation catheter when we ablated his AV junction and his his bundle paste e ECG after um, the AVJ ablation. Uh, it's nice and narrow, not perfect, um, but I think a nice um, result for him. Unfortunately, that hematoma went away. So preventing hematomas and their complications. During the implant, we need complete hemostasis. No bleeders in there. And to do that, stay within the fascial plane. Don't nick the muscle, because muscle bleeds, and it's hard to control. Think about hemostatic agents like Flow Seal, and I love to use Flow Seal in a pocket that's been oozy. Robust pocket closure, at least four suture layers is, um, I do at least four for an ICD, for example. Make sure there is no heparin around um, peri-implant, including Lovenox and subcutaneous prophylaxis. Think about a sling beyond 24 hours. We don't do that much, but you ask the patient to minimize motion so that little bleeders don't um, reactivate themselves. If there is a hematoma, you want spontaneous resorption um, without the need to reoperate. But you wonder if a vascularized tissue capsule might be helpful or would local antibiotic delivery in that scenario be helpful to uh, minimize the chance of that hematoma becoming an infection. So we know the devices migrate. Here's your incision scar. The pacemaker is now over here and sticking out. This is one reason in thin patients, I really try to anchor that pulse generator medially because we don't want it to move. When there's a lot of dense muscle at the time of implant, we don't need to anchor it, but, but be careful um, when that patient's thin or likely to become um, thinner going forward. And there's frank erosion. This was probably implanted too superficially, but you can see hardware sticking out. So now it is hopelessly infected and needs to be removed. That said, here is a frustrating case from our practice. Again, a very tiny person. They are always higher risk. Here she comes eight months post-implant from her pacemaker, and this is her pocket. Notice how ridgy this tissue is. You can feel all the contours of the device and the leads, lumpy, bumpy, and it's very uncomfortable for her. So we, in fact, revise the device, put it submuscular with a bioenvelope, trying to improve this, and went from this to this, even going submuscular, trying to pull muscle over top of everything, putting the bioenvelope in. We thought we were great. Doesn't look a whole lot better. She is more comfortable, so it was an improvement, but um, still not ideal. And why would that happen in her? Some reason she just had this tight skin. It was almost like scleroderma, but she had no diagnosis of that. And so we just chalk it up to interpersonal variability. Um, but these are things that we watch for and the results we see on the clinic side, which um, we're doing our best to avoid these scenarios at the time that we're in the lab and uh, implanting. Because I, in my mind, I'm always thinking ahead to what is this going to look like in clinic in the next weeks to months. So again, this lady with this um, allergic reaction to Steri strips, here she is seven months out before we revised her device because she's uncomfortable. Why? It's not too lateral, it's too medial. She thinks she has sternal impingement. So with all this fat, for lack of a better word, every time she moves, that device really translates, and she felt it 
pressing on her sternum more than she would like. And she requested for us to move it laterally. So fortunately, we could do that without cutting out the suture sleeves, just leave the suture sleeves anchored where they are and pull her pulse generator more laterally. That's the result we left her with in the lab. This looked much better than this. Next day on the x-ray, everything droops, and this went to this. You know, we were hoping it would be way out here, but it's here. Um, hopefully an adequate result, um, time will tell. But these are some of the uh, frustrations with trying to guesstimate where these devices should be so that our patients stay most comfortable. Here's a big guy, 280 pounds, ICD, looks beautiful. He is actually finding superficial tenderness over this device. Two years out, he requests revision. And we took that ICD and went submuscular for him to make him more comfortable. But I never would have predicted that. And looking at this device, it looks as happy as you would ever expect. Um, so you do your best in the lab, and you respond to your patients in the outpatient setting. And if there's really room to help them further, um, you know, I have a low threshold for taking people back. So pocket migration and erosion, how are we going to avoid that? Pulse generator has to be absolutely directly on the pectoral muscle. Don't leave it in the superficial skin. And sort of non-EP implanters tend to do that. And I've had to revise a number of devices from non-EP implanters, which were clearly just too superficial. But even when this doesn't work, because that's always what I you know, am sure to do, Think about going submuscular, and as you know, I have a very low threshold for going submuscular on um, thin folks, especially with pacemakers. Anchor that pulse generator medially so that it can't migrate laterally. That's especially people who don't have much subcutaneous tissue. Early pocket revision if you see concerning signs of impingement because you don't want that skin to become ischemic. And then think about improving pocket integrity with device envelopes, such as the bio envelope, which can become a vascularized living capsule. And um, we'll talk about that. And that's in contradistinction to the Tyrex pouch, which is also on the market, which is non-structural. Helps with infection, but we don't expect it to affect um, pocket quality. So again, reducing infection, Avoid any unnecessary hardware. So if somebody only needs a single chamber device, please just give them a single chamber device. As you know, Biotronic has a nice option with their DX lead for ICDs, gives you atrial diagnostics without a dedicated atrial lead, something we've really taken advantage of. Dual coil versus single coil. Almost everybody's implanting only single coil leads these days. And that's really been a benefit to our patients who may go go on to need extraction. ICD CRT without dedicated atrial lead, we've done a lot of these. The majority of our ICD CRTs, our CRTs, have not had an atrial lead. So we have the Biotronic DX lead with that atrial sensing dipole, which now is available in the CRT system. And, you know, why should you ha ever have an atrial lead? Only if you need atrial pacing. What are the heart failure guidelines for heart rates in patients with heart failure? You're supposed to be bradycardic in heart failure. You know, in fact, the drug Evabradine is approved for patients in heart failure who have, who have sinus rates above 70 beats a minute. That's pretty slow, but if you want to slow them more and there's no room with beta blockers, you can add Evabradine. It is um, indicated for that. So these folks, you don't want to speed them up. So you accept a lot of bradycardia. And if someone's in the 60s or 70s at rest on their beta blocker, that's plenty of heart rate, and you do not need to pace in that atrium. So avoid that atrial lead. It is prudent and um, consistent with uh, heart failure guidelines. So here's a scenario where we did that. Here is a CRT. You know, Here's the LV lead, the ICD lead. And here is that atrial sensing dipole. So the device is pacing asynchronous, pacing synchronous to the atrium in the ventricle, and it's getting that from just the sensing dipole, which is part of the ICD lead. You know, and this is a, in a 42-year-old man, end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis. He has a left arm fistula that's failing. That's the side we implanted on so we could preserve his right side. And then with effective CRT, we improved his ejection fraction from 25% to 50, 55%, so he should now qualify for a kidney transplant. So the therapy is worth it, but, you know, here's somebody with a compromised vein on the left side, we're using the left side, certainly a scenario where you want to minimize hardware. 
and we had that opportunity with this um, particular technology, which um, is really a nice opportunity for us. So let's start talking about pouches. This is where um, we were going with this in the first place. The first pouch on the market was what is now called the Tyrex pouch. You might remember that was initially the Aegis pouch or envelope. It was, um, this is what it looks like. It was FDA approved in 2008. There was 25,000 of these implanted by 2015. So there's 100% absorbable versus a non-absorbable version initially. The non-absorbable is gone. But that was made out of polypropylene, which is used for hernia repair. So it's super strong. It's like body armor. Um, whereas the absorbable is a tyrosine-based polymer like a resorbable suture. It disappears, minimal um, inflammatory response. And that, both of those would be impregnated with the combination of minocycline and rifampin. So those antibiotics together cover just about everything. And you say, what a great idea. And it is a great idea. You know, the concern is just if we're over you know, overuse of antibiotics and if we're creating resistance by over-treating people. Um, but it does turn out to be a, a very good combination if you just want to prevent infection. So zooming in, this is what the resorbable envelope looks like. That's the only one that's available on the market now. And um, you know, here's the weave, and you put it around your ICD, and then in the pocket, it's going to elute antibiotic, and it will slowly dissolve over about nine weeks until there's nothing left. And hopefully, that's helped you to um, prevent infection. So again, that combination of um, minocycline and rifampin, broad coverage covers all of these bugs. Whereas cefazolin, for example, you know, just covers MSSA and E. coli. That's what we use most often. Even Vanco has gaps in some of these gram negatives. Um, if you use minocycline and rifampin together, you are covering everything. So you'd expect that to work well, and it does work well. So compared to control, you know, the Tyrex um, antibiotic with um, ICDs or pacemakers or CRTs, markedly lowering infection. Not perfect, but doing, um, you know, a really good job. So it does add something and uh, something we should maybe think about. And if you're a high risk patient to begin with, you tend to benefit from the most, the most from having the antibacterial pouch. So those patients who are scored in advance to be the highest risk of infection actually derive the most benefit. So we should be using these things probably for sure in our sickest um, device patients because that's those are the folks who will um, benefit the most. And just historically, the non-absorbable pouch, I've dealt with these. This is a friend of mine from Fellowship. He's in California, and he tweeted this. He's like, back-to-back -back genera cha generator changes with the Tyrex non-absorbable pouch, you know another hard day in the lab, and this is what it looks like if you cut it out. It is literally body armor. That's what was surrounding the device. It is to prevent infection. Here is one that got infected. So this was infected. They had to take the whole thing out, and you see this very hard um, tissue um, pouch that um, was there as a result. So this it's not on the market. So this is EP history. This is another one, a device that got infected with the non-absorbable pouch. A cardiac surgeon took it out, didn't realize it was in there. Um, the patient comes back two months later with this material eroding through his skin. And oh, surprise, surprise, there's hardware in there. Um, so again, EP history, I've removed these things. I don't like them. I'm glad they're gone. And um, we're moving on. So Medtronic bought Tyrex in 2014. Aegis named, named, named it now Tyrex and only supplies the fully absorbable antibacterial pouch. So it has a couple of milligrams of each antibiotic. You soak it for 30 seconds, turn it inside out, put it around your device, implant it, suture it closed if you feel you need to, and that will elute bacteria over the next few weeks. And depending on how you define your control, the reduction in infection has been really good. You know, for ICDs, ICD, CRT, uh, depending on what population you're um, referring to. So it doesn't make it perfect, but it certainly does help. There, it looks like about a 50% benefit in that particular uh, series. So there's a new pouch on the market, and that is relatively new. It's not totally new, and this is the bio envelope. It used to be called Kangaroo. Comes in many more sizes. Was FDA approved in 2014, about the time that Medtronic bought Tyrex, and um, Biotronic became aligned with 
the bioenvelope company in 2018. So Biotronic is now helping to promote this product, which was having a hard time gain, gaining market traction. But this is um, very interesting because it is tissue and it is meant to develop tissue. So it's composed of extracellular matrix. It's this bio scaffold. It's used in regenerative medicine. It causes cell migration, infiltration, differentiation, prolifer proliferation, and will help presumably improve the structural integrity and uh, viability of our capsules when it's used in that context. So from a pig small intestine between the mucosa and submucosa, you can extract extracellular matrix, decellularize it, and develop this particular biomaterial, which we are using in a variety of applications. Here they're using that to develop valvular material within a heart and um, build valve leaflets, for example. And so it has some st st structural applications that have been used. It's been used to recreate pericardium. And most recently, folks are saying, let's also use it for a device capsule to improve on the tissue pocket. So grown, in, 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 um, grown as a smart material in different laboratories, interesting variety of applications. And just to review the immune process, when you have tissue injury, the first thing you get is an M1 response from your monocytes. And this is a pro-inflammatory state where there's tissue degradation, matrix degradation. We're trying to initially fight the infection. And then as that process evolves, those macrophages or monocytes transform themselves into a type of cell that will now promote matrix synthesis, tissue remodeling, angiogenesis, be anti-inflammatory, and the presence of the bioenvelope material promotes that M1 to M2 transition. So those cells become transitioned to a state where they're building matrix, promoting blood vessel growth, beneficial tissue remodeling in a resolution phase uh, faster when they're in the presence of the bioenvelope. And if that chronic wound should develop, basically, or if that chronic wound should persist, that transition from M1 to M2 doesn't take place. So you stay in that destructive phase of the inflammatory response if that chronic wound is not given ample opportunity to heal itself. So we'll just be aware of that. We need the tissue to be able to heal for that M1 to M2 transition to take place. And if you coat the bioenvelope in different antibiotics, it does repel bacteria. In a rabbit model of device infection, here's Staph aureus on a device. And if you impregnate that um, capsule now with gentamicin or with vanco plus genta, you see that you can do a very good job in um, blocking um, that capsular infection. And that's also true with um, staph epidermidis. So what we're doing is we take the pouch, we soak it in our antibiotic wash, which could be the vanco or the, um, or the um, cefazolin. When it's soaked, you just place your device uh, inside the tissue capsule, inside the tissue pouch. You can suture it closed if you feel you need to. Usually we don't feel that you need to. And um, insert it into the pocket. There's the device inside that tissue envelope. And we're going to put it inside the pocket now and um, allow that different type of capsule to form. So we've shown that a two minute soak in the antibiotic solution is just as good as 10 minutes. And that's why we do two minutes. And um, so we don't have to stand there forever. And it's just as beneficial. And we will see um, the bio envelope surrounding the device going into the tissue pocket and um, expecting a very different type of tissue capsule to result. So again, once that is implanted, we begin a remodeling process, an angiogenic process, where tissue capsules, rather than being avascular, if you can image the microvasculature, you'll see that there are plenty of vessels that are surrounding that device. Now you can deliver blood to the device surface because you have a living tissue surrounding it. And that's very interesting if it's going to improve pocket integrity, help us to fight infection, even late infection, um, because we can deliver right to the device. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see if that proves to be the case. So here again, evidence of tissue capsules, which are clearly vascular. There's plenty of blood vessels directly in contact with uh, the device. It really is a very different pocket. 
and one that promises to be uh, tremendously advantage advantageous to us. We have a little bit of our own experience with the late response of that tissue. Here's an 85-year-old lady. We had implanted her. We realized she needed an atrial lead, which we hadn't put in. So we went in two, two months later to revise that device. You, we can see here on the device surface, it looks like that tissue capsule that's already forming is vascular. So that was an interesting response. Nevertheless, when we removed the device, there were large chunks of that material which quite obviously hadn't um, resorbed or transformed themselves into anything else. So two months was too early, um, but some promising early results in our own experience. It would be really interesting when the time for generator changes uh, comes, you know, but that's um, a little bit away. Again, that microfill polymer to delineate vasculature showing us a very different um, tissue capsule that is available to us in all of those scenarios that scare us. This is a very scary scenario to implant a device, and you wonder if that tissue capsule, if that um, bioenvelope could be advantageous in this scenario. And this is a very scary scenario, you know. We have these elderly folks, they're thin, They've had a lot of weight loss. There's not a lot of subcutaneous tissue. We need to implant hardware. Would a bioenvelope be beneficial in this scenario as well? It's very promising. We don't have long-term results yet, but um, those, are certainly, um, those are certainly coming up. So when is the bioenvelope indicated? Certainly in those concerning patients. And you wonder then, should it also be given whenever we're anticipating a device to progress to a change out or when we're performing capsulectomy at the time of a change out uh, or maybe just for all change outs? How many patients to include is uh, a question yet to be determined. We are certainly doing it in concerning scenarios like this. When the pocket is clearly really deep, there's a huge area of thick tissue covering it, it's buried way down there, we probably don't bother with the additional expense of putting the bioenvelope around it. But when there are concerns in thin patients or the, sub, the subcutaneous tissue just does not have um, a lot of integrity, we're certainly using the um, product in those scenarios. So as a summary, I know it's been long. I know this has been going on for a long time. Appreciate your attention. If we gave um, competitive summary, if we give Biotronic one shot at their competitor for sponsoring this, what would they say about Tyrex? They would say there's no extracellular matrix. It's just a synthetic mesh. It doesn't revascularize to stable the device. It resorbs in nine weeks. It has a sh short shelf life. And forever, that was only 30 to 40 days. Now it's three months. So it's not as bad, but people are buying the product and then not using it, and it expires, and you've wasted money. So that's gotten better, but it's still somewhat of an issue. It's not available for all patients. There's a number of contraindications and warning, warnings, and that is people will have allergies to minocycline and rifampin. Minocycline can cause a lupus-like syndrome, so we have to think about those things. There's some limited size options. Um, you may need to resize the device pocket just to accommodate that envelope because it can be a little bulky. There's none available for, say, the subcutaneous ICD. And are we applying too many antibiotics and promoting antibiotic resistance? In my mind, to summarize where we are, where is the state of the art? We know Tyrex is non-structural, but it is really good antimicrobial, very, um, very broad spectrum. Limited by sh three months shelf life, we have a lot more data, so we really know how this works in the real world and performs in the real world. It is a Medtronic product. The bio envelope is the new kid in the block. It's a structural living type of envelope, very intriguing. It's antimicrobial based on whatever you decide to soak it in. So that tends to be a more limited spectrum. There really is indefinite shelf life, which makes it much more manageable in the cath lab. Um, limited data is available on its real long-term performance in the real world, so we're waiting for that. And it is now a Biotronic uh, sponsored product. So 
Thank you very much.